age is needed, learning through intergenerational friendship, um, and to introduce the beautiful panelists that we have with us today, um, Shivani, Karima, Sanisa, Rosalio, welcome, welcome. Before we get started, I wanted to invite everyone into a deep breath together. Mm -hmm. Just to land. Whatever you're coming with is welcome in the space. I invite you to get as comfortable as you can. Um, I know my my back is sometimes not happy with being on Zoom for long periods of time, so I'm going to be moving about a little bit. I invite you to do the same. That feels good for your body. I invite you to close your eyes. I would like you to bring to your mind escape a younger or an older friend who has been a significant part of your learning journey. I'd like to invite you to invite them or their energy into this moment, their teachings, their support, provocations, disruptions. Just take a moment to send them your gratitude. Add another breath. Rise again. My name is Sierra, part of the conference team. I just wanted to share a quick word about why this title of All Ages Needed, needed Learning Through Intergenerational, Intergenerational Friendship. I come from a context of uh, quite a lot of separation. Um, I didn't grow up in sort of like a village or a community setting um, that felt very healthy. Um, so I hold a lot of sadness around um, around. So a lot of a lot of like there's some grief, but there's also like a lot of excitement about what is possible around the healing of intergenerational relationships. I have some stories from my own family line where education actually was a tool that uh, or was kind of a factor that actually separated um, parents from children and um, really created a lot of. Uh, almost insurmountable separation between generations in my family. Um, so I'm really, I'm really partly convening this panel um, for my own healing um, and, and, and I'm excited to hear the stories from our panelists who come from contexts where they have intergenerational um, community spaces um, and, and projects that are, that are alive and, and bringing this healing into the world. Um, and so, um, I just wanted to say a word on, on the word friendship, um, something that came across my radar recently uh, from this book by a, a friend named Matt Hearn called, Oh My Friends, There Is No Friend, The Politic of Friendships at the End of Ecology. The link in the chat later. Um, but one of the, the sort of definitions of friendship that I've been sitting with lately that's been really helpful um, has been this idea that friendship is any relationship um, whether human or beyond human, um, that has two qualities to it. One being that it's um, mutually consensual. So each party is consenting to be in this in this relationship that wants to be in, the, in this relationship. And two, that there's a mutual desire for well-being. Um, for me, this is just a very simple context for, for what friendships can be. And within that, of course, we can um, imagine all of the possibilities. Um, friendship transcends human-made borders, um, transcends the rational, can break capitalism and supremacy. Friendship is truly magic um, and something that um, I feel like I'm just starting to explore. So with that, um, I'd like to, yeah, to introduce 
briefly, uh, I'll be reading um, these uh, intros or bios from our panelists, and then I'll, I'll, they will introduce themselves further. Um, so we have with us Sunisa Jemuset Baters. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, is a co-founder of Gaia Ashram Eco Village and Learning Center based on Eco Village Design Education, Deep Ecology, and Permaculture, which provide various learning programs to international participants. Sunisa is a co-founder also of Nature's Way Foundation, whose mission focuses on supporting and providing learning opportunities to local communities and local schools. We also have here, welcome Sunisa. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, we also have Karima Kadawi. Uh, Karima, Karima is a Tam Keen facilitator and lived experience researcher, growing a shared understanding of societal metamorphosis and emerging governance from lived experience. She co founded Tam Keen Community Foundation for Human Development in 20, 2009, and with the Moroccan education ecosystem, co facilitates its self facilitated transformation process manifesting in emerging community-based learning and understanding ecosystems. Karima is a full member of the Club of Rome and serves an, as an advisor in the Board of Africa Voices Dialogue, reflecting and amplifying the beauty of the voices and teachers and learners in Africa. We have with us, welcome Karima. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. We also have um, Apollinaire Usolio. Prince Dejaka Wainu Atawe of the Tolinu Indigenous Community of Benin, or Benin, Nigeria, and the diaspora. He is the president of the NGO Grab Benin, which works for the conservation of biodiversity and the protection of sacred sites. Geographer, naturalist, expert in jurisprudence of the earth, he works for the conservation of natural resources based on the knowledge of ancestors and through intergenerational dialogue. At the international level, Usolio is also in, involved as vice president of the African Biodiversity Network and is a member of the executive community of the Guardians, uh, the Alliance of Guardians of Mother Nature. Thank you for being with us, Usolio. Maybe you can wave. <laughs> People can see where you are. Thank you. Um, and finally, we have Shivani Davids, who's a dear friend. Uh, a social researcher and learning enthusiast who is dedicated to tra transforming the way we approach learning and personal growth. He founded Reimagined Learning Community in, in South Africa, a platform that incorpor incorporates wisdom from young people, nature, and intuition to help individuals receive, achieve their full potential. Shivani embraces the power of plant medicine, spends time with his son and family, and taps into the limitless well of inspiration from his dreams. Welcome, Shivani, for being here. <laughs> Lastly, we have uh, we had a, another panelist that would be joining us named Helen Hughes. Unfortunately, she um, had has COVID right now. Um, she just let me know yesterday that she has like a terrible sore throat and won't be able to jo be joining us, uh, which is very sad be for me because she is such a great um, elder um, and has so many stories, beautiful stories to share. Um, she ran a learning, uh, a free democratic school in Vancouver in Canada for about 40 years, which was a completely unicorn uh, project um, that touched many, many, many lives. And um, yes, uh, you can read more about her on the contributors page of the website. Um, and yeah, I'm sorry that she won't be here, but I will do my best to channel her wisdom and energy to the space. Um, and with that, I would like to toss a question out into the room. Um, and this is a question, um, yeah, maybe we can start with um, Karima. Um, from your experience, what alchemy is possible within mixed age encounter collaboration and friendship? What does it look like for a learning space to be in service? to intergenerational repair and reconnection instead of separation. We'd love to hear the same question for all of you, each of you panelists. Um, and I would love if you would like to share a story from, from your context, from, from your intergenerational space, your project, um, or just from your own life. And I'll pass it over to you, Karina, to start us off. 
Um, thank you, Sierra, for the beautiful question. Uh, I I will resonate with your question rather than answer with a, with a story. So I will take you to Morocco. Welcome uh, to the province of Laash um, and to um, to a village and um, um, in the rural area of the province of Laash. And um, I remember we were in the school and there was, um, in that school, there was the inspector of the school, the director of the school, there were teachers, there were uh, students. It was a primary school. And we were very, very beautifully welcomed. Actually, there was a lot of expectation of something new was gonna happen that day. And, uh, and I remember how the teachers made cakes uh, for us to welcome us. And, uh, and as we were, so we started very formal. And as soon as possible, I invited everyone to go out into the beautiful open space they had. And we were all standing in a circle and sharing our names and, um, and tossing this bag. And, uh, and, and there was a lot of shyness initially, but slowly that shyness started to dissolve. And, and then I asked the question, in this school, can you please share what is your favorite place? And, and can you show it to us? And we go all follow you and you tell us why. And so the teacher started and, and until he came to this little girl and she told us, my favorite place is that tree over there. And we turned around and we looked at the tree. She did not take us to the tree, but she said, that tree is the tree where I met with my sister. We would always meet at that tree. And my sister died. Suddenly, at that moment, there was no longer the inspector. There was no longer the teacher. There was no longer the director. And there was no longer the student. The tree had meaning, the school had meaning. We were all together in our humanity. And the most vulnerable moment of realizing how precious it was that that little girl shared that story with us as an expression of her trust. Thank you so much for that story, Karina. Mm. Mm. I'll pass it now to Lisa Leo, who would like to continue the storytelling train. N'était pas dans les quatre murs, c'est la. So Leo, your your audio is very uh, choppy. Maybe you turn off your camera. Ah, bah, bah, ficus. Et tous les soirs, avec le feu, le grand père assis nous amène à découvrir. À nous-mêmes le savoir. Il n'y a pas de coups à recopier, il n'y a pas de décisions à faire. Il est assis et il ne parle que pas des proverbes, des contes, des légendes. Et ces contes et ces légendes nous enseignent le savoir. Le savoir être et le savoir vivre. Et souvent, les deux hommes choisis sont les hommes des animaux, des plantes, 
des relations entre l'homme et la nature. Ce grand enseignant que la nature parlait par le grand-père et nous, les plus jeunes, les enfants, on est à l'écoute, assis en sec. Voilà une partie de l'éducation que j'ai reçue en école patrimoniale que je continue jusqu'à aujourd'hui dans des dialogues intergénérations. En conclusion de cette histoire, le savoir où nous cherchons à évaluer pour trouver le premier, le deuxième, le troisième est diminutif pour nous, peuples autochtones, parce qu'on sait qu'en chacun se trouve un savoir, une connaissance, une éducation. Et s'asseoir dans le cercle, ça permet d'être dans l'égalité, dans les partages de connaissances entre le plus petit et le plus grand, le plus petit qui peut apprendre au plus grand et le plus grand au plus petit. Ça, c'est ce que nous appelons l'éducation dans l'école patrimoniale. Et nous le faisons toujours aujourd'hui dans les couvents qui sont des forêts et sites sacrés. Voilà un peu l'histoire que je vous raconte précisément au Bénin au sud-est dans la communauté Tolino. Merci. Um, so we'll continue the story telling. I'll pass it now to uh, Sunisa, if you would like to come in. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> uh, it's my background, maybe too dark for you. <laughs> I'm saying hello from Thailand. Now it's really early in the morning. Uh, four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so everything a bit dark around me. <laughs> um, this is my first time to, uh, being in the Ecoversity online circle. So I'm really, really happy that finally I make it here. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful for Manish who consistently <laughs> keeping uh, sending invitations. And then I'm really grateful that eventually I make it here. So I'd like to also uh, start responding to the questions with the, a little bit of personal experience and stories that I um, grew up in a village, in a rural uh, area in the countryside of uh, Thailand, far away from the center of Thailand. And uh, most of my life experience has been in the multi-generational uh, space a learning space as I went to school, which is a village school, which some of the parents or the people from the community were the teachers, and they also run the school. And um, we were in the environment where uh, the community uh, led the school. So then I had that experience of being in a space where not only experiencing learning from other uh, elders, but also feel very blessed and realizing my space as in the community. So I think like learning in the space of a community with multi generations or uh, different ages or different um, learning from people from different backgrounds is bringing quite, is bring a lot of rich learning experience. And um, not only what we learned, uh, the knowledge that we were taught, but also we learned about who we are, about um, our relationship with other people, and then developed that kind of mutual respect toward each other, because we know that how we will support. I think that in the experience of being in a school that in the village school like that, giving a lot of insight and um, a lot of connections, not only to the people, but also to the community, to the land, 
that had inspired me a lot to create a learning space like that. So eventually, after my journey of le uh, leaving my hometown, home village to study in university and work in other eco village, uh, I was then, uh, I eventually I came back to my home village and then trying to support that school, which I am working with uh, now with the local village school as our uh, government trying to centralize the small school in the village and move the kids from the village to the bigger school where it's more focused in the academic study. So I saw that um, we are losing that learning space, such as a village school where everybody's in the village involved in the, learn, in the co-creating that learning space. So, um, so yeah, I think that is what I'm working uh, on with the local community is trying to still hold and then co-creating that learning space where we can have people, not only the adults in the community that help to create the learning space, but also the children to also create their own learning space uh, in the village school as well. And when we start the eco village, Kai uh, Ashram, we also trying to bring in this aspect of um, embracing different age and then the welcoming families with children to join in the learning space. So I think from to summarize, I think what I experienced in this um, kind of learning environment is that it's bringing in a lot of rich learning, especially the learning that emphasize on um, different experiences. Even children or even people with all different age, we all have a very unique experience. And experience, I believe, is a material for uh, wisdom and uh, understanding uh, of ourselves, who we are, and also our world. Because experience is our, you know, interaction and perspective uh, with what is going on in the world, even though. Uh, people may not have a very long experience because they are having a, their children, their kids, but their experience are very different from us and they're very unique in their own way. I think how can, um, a way of creating multi-generations or all ages learning space is about honoring the unique experience of each one. Um, and then how can we see that as a unique part in the learning space that we could learn from and then we can bring it the richness in that uniqueness of experiences. Yeah, I think that is what I had to offer for now. <laughs> I got excited and uh, maybe I will talk too much. Uh, so I will just pause for now. <laughs> so wonderful to meet you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. I'll pass it to you, Shivani. Yo, okay. Greetings, everyone. Bless up. Ancestral greetings. It's how it is. So there's no way we're going to speak about interrational, intergenerational learning uh, without tapping into our child self. So invitation just for like two seconds to grab your ears and contort your face like a child, like pull, do some... <laughs> just so we can like be with child self and speak about intergenerational learning, not just like an external children as an external experience. All of us here were children. So to speak about intergenerational learning is to speak about your learning, our learning. Still, still. Uh, yeah, so psh, my mind was going all over the place and I'm so grateful for the speakers that have just spoken and how you guys spoke about basically spaces that exist in my dreams, uh, Memories, uh, a word that has came to me recently is a community of memories, community of memories. Uh, and when, as you guys were speaking, I, I, I invited myself to embrace the idea of community of memories as, as these dreams, these experiences are deeply connected to me. Um, so, let me see, where do we even begin to enter this portal? Uh, 
maybe maybe we can start by some technical stuff like how uh oh maybe some wisdom elder wisdom so um uh, one of the things that came to me in this week in listening to i think it was a podcast uh was the elder speaking um uh, and speaking about the crisis and speaking specifically how like the rational western mainstream mind experiences this crisis as an external experience something happening outside uh, the body such as the pollution or the multiple wars or whether it's an external experience and what the elder was leaning towards is that in his cosmovision in the community he's from the crisis is an internal thing it doesn't it doesn't happen outside it's internal and if we look at how sort of time and a lot of these contexts or things that we experience, how they index. And when I say index, time indexes, it frames, it creates a certain idea. And in our current programming or matrix, time is used to indicate and to sort of uh, colonize each other. So for instance, just this divide that we have within ourselves that when we speak about children, we speak about external selves. We don't speak about ourselves as children. Uh, language in English also looks at child, childish. If I say, hey, and I say this in comfort of friendship with Sierra, like, hey, Sierra, you, you, you're childish. And if Sierra was probably like mainstream and not Sierra, I don't know what portal that would be, but I can only imagine some, some world that doesn't really exist where that would be a trigger. Like there's a trigger when I say you are childish, you are childlike sort of this tension and if we talk about intergenerational relationships i think the first i will be honest with you guys i i'm going to be a bit over up with language but it's it's a, it's a shitty experience it's been like the most great chaos experience the idea of forming intergenerational uh, relationships why because young people trigger they trigger me they make me feel things that I wasn't ready to feel at the time. What, but this trigger was not sort of this confrontational trigger. It was more like medicine. They were serving me medicine. They were asking me, Shavani, remember. Remember me. Remember yourself. And I've been on this journey with young people in remembering myself and restoring my childhood. And I'll share one quick story. So one of the first mentors I had in my unschooling and learning journey was a young a uh, person uh, at the age of, I think, five years old, they already could define themselves outside of normal norms and gendered norms. Uh, they, it was the first probably person I met who used, who was, who used like non-binary, binary. They, they never decided to, to occupy male or female. They just said, I am. And you can imagine coming from oh, a world where that wasn't a reality, there was tension there. I was like, oh, what do you mean? Like, so just inviting the 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 the, the story of being triggered. Uh, and then of course, uh surrendering, being vulnerable and to to allow myself not to know I'm right, not to use that indexing of I know I'm right, and you can't tell me I'm an adult. I what my way or the highway type of thing. Uh I softened. I was invited, invited, invited to soften. The same young person said it was probably the most profound moment. One of the most profound moments in my life is that. So they set us up. I was doing some homeschooling thing and they said, yeah, a group of kids, five kids. Uh, do the teaching thing and hopefully at the end of the year, you can sub give us a report card. Uh, that was the intention that curated this interaction. And so one of the days. I asked Leah, so Leah, bro, your parents leave every morning and they leave you alone well you guys alone with me don't you have any like uh don't you have longing for your parents don't you miss them don't you like feel any sense of like grief your parents are gone you know you've been with them every day this is your first experience of school or at least your second experience of school i'll tell you that for the first in a bit and leah says brah what do you mean miss them close your eyes so i was like what close my eyes the child is up to some mad mischief I close my eyes. I don't give in to the voices. <laughs> I close my eyes. When I close my eyes, Leah says, bro, can you see your mom? And 
day I manifest the vision or the image of my mom with my eyes closed. Leah's like, bruh, can you hear your mom? And there, in my vision, with my eyes closed, I hear my mom. Leah says, open up your eyes, Shivani. So how can you miss, how can you long for someone when you just have access to them like that? And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. This is mad. This is mad. This is metaphysics. And you expect, that your, your parents expect me to do the cur at cat thing with you and all of those other things. Yet you are sitting here as a wisdom keeper, as someone close to the ancestors, as a, as a living ancestor. You are sitting here and you're giving me downloads like early in the morning <laughs> where I'm supposed to take on some other role and you're supposed to take on some other role. But the invitation to your softness, the invitation to listen and to just shut up and to be triggered and sit with it and not do that at all thing, just to be present with it. Yeah, that, that has been sort of a guiding principle. And it's through that that I've had the ability to sit with many elders, to sit with many wisdom keepers. I even like the idea of our biological version of ancestor, the being that there was previously childhood as ancestor. The fact that all of us can tap into our version of ancestor for, for, for this adult version face that we have. An ancestor for our bodies is childhood, is our childhood memories, is our experiences in child, a child's realm or child's mind. So I put childhood on the altar as an experience that, that that definitely has the capacities. And a friend of mine, okay, last thing, a friend of mine speaks about this idea of capacities that have been exiled. Her name is Vanessa Andriotti, massive wisdom keeper. Uh, and she speaks about this idea of capacities, human capacities, ways of seeing, ways of thinking, ways of dreaming, ways of, yeah, all ways of ways that have been locked away, trapped away due to our current system. And when we come to conferences like this, when we get into communities of practice, where we tap into our communities of memory, we have the ability to bring through capacities that have been exiled, that have been longing to be picked up and played with and danced with. And I'm seeing childhood, child scapes, child beings, even in the adult body, as one of these exiled capacities that have keys, clues, and even questions for our reality right now. Drops mic. Thank you, Shivani. Wow. Thank you all for bringing in these stories. I think just to like, yeah, Tr I want to transport us all to like a campfire where we're sitting around and, and we're listening to stories from our beautiful friends. Um, so much wisdom in there. Um, yes. I really appreciate Karima, you bringing in sort of the, the possibility of in any context, however structured it might be, that this possibility of like encountering our humanity through um, these just, yeah, moments of, of just being present with each other, whatever is actually happening. And, um, and yes, um, so Leo for this bringing in your grandfather and uh, the ancestors and then in that space, um, so Nisa, the, the, the emphasis on like just how important it is to have these different perspectives, um, how we miss out from so much when we don't have that, um, we aren't sharing space with, with, I mean, we, I think I agree, I, I am grateful for you bringing in this, this notion also Shivani of like, in reality, we are all the ages within, we have all the ages within ourselves. Um, and I think we do forget, and I think we need to be reminded and to share space with people of different ages. Um, um, it was absolutely needed to, to remind ourselves of of, um, of, that, of those different ways of perceiving the world um, and being in the world. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to share one little piece about something that I've found actually quite shocking um, in the world that I, some of the worlds that I exist in <laughs> where um, I've had the experience multiple times now where there's people of, of roughly my age. So like somewhere in the middle of like the human um, lifespan um, have like shared just quite bluntly and, and with no sort of regard of it 
being a funny thing to say or like a, a upsetting thing to say for me that um, I just don't like children. I don't like spending time with old people. It's uncomfortable. Like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I have nothing in common with them. Um, and I've I've heard this enough times, like just genuinely from people that I love and that I admire, um, that I feel like, um, yeah, there's just, there's healing to be done. <laughs> and and I think maybe in your context, um, this may be less common. Um, but I guess my next question would be, we'll do another round of how do you, how do you facilitate these, these connections for others who may not, may, may not become, come as easily, you know, I think it's a learning journey for all of us, but, um, yeah, what, what tools or what, um, what ways can we support each other, um, in, in feeling less awkward and, in, in feeling, um, less afraid of, of this difference, um, and remembering and reconnecting, like you said, Giovanni, to our, our inner ancestors and inner children. Um, and we'll start actually, we'll say, Leo, if, you, if you're, if you can hear me well, I know you were having some connection problems, um, but if you want to start, I know um, the translator who's here may not be able to stay the whole time, so maybe we start with with you if you would like to share. Um, and I think, yeah, keeping your video off, maybe the, the audio will come through clear. Clement uh, will take the... The translation. Okay, great. Oh, okay. wonderful. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Carl. Well, so, Leo, are you there? Can you hear us? Maybe someone could speak to him in French. Yeah, he really is. Hey. Uh, do you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Can you, uh, tu peux me, me reprendre la question? Oh, yeah. You want to say it? Little... Can you say it in French? Um, how do you help facilitate intergenerational connections between us? Okay. Quelqu'un peut me traduire la question? Oui, moi je peux traduire. Euh, Merci. Faciliter ces, ces connexions intergénérationnelles. Comment faciliter ces relations entre différentes générations? Comment créer ces conditions? Très bien. Yeah. Je pense que euh, la connexion intergénération, euh, pour faciliter, il faut d'abord connaître la place et les lois de connexion entre les générations. Et ça veut dire okay. génération. Si on va dans le sens où euh, on vient comme un professeur ou un étudiant qui veut euh, corriger son professeur, la connexion intergénération peut avoir des biais. Donc, que de chaque côté, les jeunes qui viennent vers les plus anciens doivent avoir le sens de l'écoute, la disponibilité et surtout la concentration, sinon on est trop distrait aujourd'hui par nos téléphones, euh, les réalités autour de nous, les bruits autour de nous, on n'a même pas le temps d'écouter la nature et d'écouter les anciens. Donc il faut trouver l'espace qu'il faut dans la nature, quelque part où il y a moins de bruit, mais aussi qu'il n'y a pas d'interférence de plusieurs machines à la fois, euh, les, ce qu'on appelle les bouffeurs de temps. 
à regarder notre heure, à regarder le portable, est-ce qu'on a un message, etc. Donc aujourd'hui, je pense que nous devons aller à l'école de la sagesse pour la génération qui veut apprendre et aussi si les anciens doivent venir, ils doivent nécessairement savoir que oh, c'est un rendez-vous de donner et de recevoir. Parce que si ça va dans un seul sens, ça serait comme des cours à l'université. Il faut que les plus anciens puissent donner l'occasion aux plus jeunes de poser des questions, d'avoir de, de leur aussi impression sur ce que dit l'ancien. Donc voilà ce que je pense. Pour réussir, il faut qu'on trouve les milieux justes qui peuvent permettre la concentration. Il faut l'humilité, il faut l'ouverture, mais il faut toujours le sens de l'écoute. Et sur, quand on veut faire les dialogues intergénérations, pour nous les peuples autochtones, le verbe c'est de l'air. Et qui dit verbe dit pour envoyer à l'autre, il faut que son esprit soit préparé à recevoir ce que vous voulez dire. Et pour que son esprit soit, soit préparé, il faut que nécessairement vous soyez dans la vérité. Que ce que vous dites puisse être de la vérité et que en retour, celui qui écoute le récepteur puisse aussi donner sa vérité. Pas de vérité absolue, le plus petit va apprendre de plus grand, mais le plus grand peut s'inspirer du plus petit pour aller loin. Voilà ce que je peux partager sur ça. Merci. You call me in, Sarah? Yes, please. I'm so inspired by but everything that I'm hearing. Thank you, merci. Um, I, um, I will share another story just to just to grow in understanding with you how it is possible as you were saying in all places even in the most structured hierarchical places when we are able to connect to a deep humanity the humanity that defines us in our finite selves but also connects us to each other to our natural world and to the whole beyond our conscious grasp uh, rendering us uh, infinite Um, uh, I, I was asked, I will take you to another province in Morocco. Um, I remain in the education system, but all that we are experiencing goes far beyond the education system. Actually, what is quite amazing is that it, it becomes a, an eco ecosystem, an ecology of co-flourishing. Uh, between the schools and the villages and the neighborhoods, Uh, where it grows an understanding that for the student to, to flourish or the child to flourish, well, the adult flourishes, needs to flourish. And, and we create conditions for each other, which is another way, I think, to resonate in, uh, uh, with, with the, the beautiful wisdom that was shared by Usulio. Um, and, and how inspiring, Shivani, when you invite us to go back to say, you know, meet, meet, meet me, remember me and remember yourself. So I will share with you this story. I was in a, in a different region, actually, and uh, in a province of Fes. And the director of the governance body at the regional level, uh, I remember it was quite early in the morning and we were having workshops during the whole day. He says, Karima, I have an idea. Um, we all the inspectors and orientators of the whole region are meeting to discuss the results of students of schools in the whole region. And I'd really want them to not to see only numbers, but to understand that those numbers, those grades actually Uh, uh, their stories, their human beings, and it's not just to, to, to reflect it in terms of data. 
So, and, and we had such little time and I was there with the facilitators of the education system because that is something also that grew fairly recently, the education system facilitating its own transformation process, emanating from the potential of the system, from the beauty that we may recognize and realize together. So uh, we, it was a very large group. So we created two circles, a circle within a circle, and they were all facing each other. And, and please, let's do this together right now. As I'm saying the questions, just try to, to go and to reflect those questions. And I'll just go with the four questions. So the first question was, what was your dream when you were a child? And how does that dream is connected with what you are doing today? How did that dream that might have had a shape before took another shape today, but you still recognize the dream of the child that you were? So they had two minutes to share that story among each other. And then the second question. Are you with me? Are you ready for the second question? So the second question was, who was that teacher when you were in primary school or secondary school or mid school that deeply, deeply affected you, deeply impacted you, that moved you? And how did he move you positively? In a way that you can say it was positive. It was like he deeply created an impression on me. And why? And how did he do it? And how do you see that impression in the, yourself today as an inspector, as uh, an orientator in the education system? The third question, and they were, had the two minutes, they were sharing, and I could hear the voices getting louder. There was the, in the air, you could hear a, a, a different vibration, a different vibration and excitement. And when I said, stop, everybody was wanting to continue to share. And then they turned. So every time they meet a different person, and then they, when they meet the third, per, the third person, they said, okay, so who's that teach you? teacher that deeply touched you, but negatively hurt you? How did he hurt you? How did you affect you, impact you, leave a negative impression on you? And that negative impression, how do you see it today that you are an inspector, today that you're an orientator? How do you see it? Where do you see it? And how does it speak in what you do? So then again, they're sharing with each other, and then you hear the voices getting even louder at that moment. It becomes even more emotional, more tension, more. And then the last question. And to be honest, I did not know what that question was going to be. I was so much in that resonance and the question came to me. And as they were inspectors and orientators and they were supposed to meet students, to tell them, to guide them and their choices in life and their studies, I said, imagine now you are meeting a student and you're going into the room and the student is facing you're seeing the, the back of your student. You go into the room and you turn around to sit in front of the student and you meet yourself. What are you going to tell yourself? And at that moment, there was no more excitement. At that moment, everything went still. It was silent. And I felt my heart started beating. And slowly, slowly, they started sharing. I left them, give them the full time to share that. Meeting themselves, as Shivani, you were saying. How do you meet yourself? What would you tell yourself? And I remember when my daughter was nine years old, she was sharing this story. She told me, mommy, I was asked to ask a story in school. You write, and I'll tell you. 
She was telling me a story of three doors in a forest. The first door, the second door, and the third, third door. I will go quickly. The first door, she went into the world of the infinitely small, the proton, the electron, and she was telling me all these things. She went out amazed. She goes to the second door. She says, I went into the world of the infinitely good, great, big. It was the universe. I saw colors and shapes I never, ever, never, no one ever saw. By then I was saying, what is she going to tell me in the third door? And then she goes into the third door and she goes in. She said, there's a city and the people are walking three by three. And as they're walking, she said, I know the third little girl noticed that they looked alike. And then suddenly she realized that it was the same person, that every person was walking with their younger self, with their past self and their future self. Wow. <laughs> part of me just wants to go into breakouts and do the prompts <laughs> together um sounds really beautiful um that invitation thank you for sharing that pretty much well i'll pass it to you Shanisa. thank you that was mesmerizing now i forgot what i wanted to say <laughs> <laughs> about it okay I did a moment <laughs> but I think uh yeah I think what I like to share related to what you said also um Karima I think circle within the circle that is something I think I could link to what I wanted to share that is I think a certain time of our personal learning journey, there might be time where we want to just distance ourselves from the diversities within the group and then uh, having a little bit of space just to feel your own, uh, your own selves and then share yourself with people who have common experience or common age. And then how can we see that as a circle within circles? which means that creating an environment where that is allowed to be and then um, without having it uh, feel like they need to disconnect themselves from the connection with the, the multi-generations within the space. But it's rather than having some distance, having some space, and then within, with the awareness that I am a circle of us, we are in the circle within the bigger circle, which is the bigger circle of many multi generation, uh, multi generational circles. And I think the important key that I see uh, for creating this kind of environment is the mutual respect. How can we also respect uh, that and then allowing that to be? And then I think when we feel respected, and then there is no need to exclude ourselves from 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 it, and then you can feel like you you can still be who you are, knowing what you want, and uh, still feeling part of the bigger circle of the diversities of uh, all ages group. And I believe that um, when that is allowed to be, and then we without feeling guilt about it that uh, I just don't want to spend time with kids now or I just don't want to spend time with the elders now I just want to be with hanging out and learning with people from my own age and with the common or similar experience I think I would see that as okay maybe that is also necessary for the learning and then that is also uh, could bring in um, that kind of enrichment of learning that contributing to the bigger circles of the diversities of where everybody is just allowing to be and then we come together as in the mutual respect the kids are allowing to be the kids without feeling like uh, they need to manner themselves not to bother others you know i think how can we creating the space where where all just feel comfortable with where they are and then the 
feel that um, being together is in the diversity is comfortable and um, you can still be yourself. That that is uh, I have for now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sinfa. Shivani. What an honor to share space and to sit at the feet of you guys and to journey with you guys. Hmm. There's so much there that resonates so deeply. I think one of the strongest threads that I hear echoed is sort of this call for humanity. In the context here in Africa, it's a call for Ubuntu. Um, I think before we get into that, uh, I want to sort of bring a sense of sobriety, uh, a sense of awareness and posturing to the reality that sort of the individualistic uh, dominant culture narrative is delicious. It feels good. It That is the dominant story. And I, I want us to sort of just land with that and sit with that. Because this, this is, like, I think, a very critical element in, in understanding where we are and what it, what it means to move towards that which, we, which has been invited, that which has been remembered, that which has been practiced, that which is kept in the stories, which is held in the stories, is that there's been this narrative that has sort of uh, yeah, romanticized the individualisticness, the sort of compartmentalization even of self uh, that will allow one to even think of myself as an I, uh, as, as if that even exists. Uh, and yes, the circle in the circle. And how would one respond to people or folks that are maybe just... and like it's, there's no sort of like shame or guilt in it, like or are still maybe holding dominant stories or have no option but to hold on to dominant stories. I think the activism there is is neither an argument, is neither sort of uh, are, are, are sending them a book on how to unschool your life. I think the activism there is probably the most interesting form of activism and its resonance. It's the Sufi proverb says, the one who remembers, be sure to look around you and awaken the others that have that are still sleeping. And I think how that shows up with regard to this work is to be the child to do that invitation that we all can hold our ears and pull a funny face at each other. I think it's probably going to be far different than what we ever could think. Uh, it's one going to be one of these exiled capacities on how do we, how do we remind each other? How do we evoke this deep memory? Uh, all of us in this space were once children. Some of us are still are just maybe think of us in different ways. So the, the, there's no, there's no need for reconnection. Because it's a, it's a it's it's a only one very sort of crazy story that says we we are disconnected and that we need to be reconnected. That is like one weird ass story that I'm choosing not to subscribe to. Um, and I think in 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 being in embodying how that choosing the narratives I choose to adopt in 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 embodying the playfulness in embodying. The, the fact that I see myself truly through everybody, through everything, this laptop I look at, the couch that I'm sitting on, the walls that I hear, I'm evoking the idea that I'm in relationship to everything. So even this idea of intergenerational friendship, let's crack it a bit. Let's see how far we can stretch our minds. Let's see if it's not just human-based friendships. Let's see if we can be the children of mountains. Let's see if we can be the children of the rivers, the seas, the oceans, of the garments we wear, the eyes we look in. When you take off your shoes and socks and you walk bare feet, that is an intergenerational dialogue. The ancient wisdoms are speaking. And just because we can't name it and we can't see it, Wi-Fi exists, we can't name it, we can't see it, believe in it. Just like we do the Wi-Fi, it exists. 
and it's waiting for us, just like Leah offered me that invitation. Remember me. And in remembering me, in remembering this capacity to be a child, to close your eyes and to see the reality you wish to see and be with it in the most intimate way, remember me. And in that, yet you will remember yourself. Mm, I have goosebumps. <laughs> wow. Wow, 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 wow. Thank you to each of you so, so much. I really, I honor each of your experiences and the wor many worlds and the many stories that have, are converging here in this moment and the seeds of wisdom that you've planted for all of us, um, awakening our own seeds. This this connection, this this understanding that we all have within in us. Um, thank you for this remembering together, all of the listening and attention. Um, resonating with this phrase, there is no need for reconnection. We are connected, like we're connected to the Wi-Fi. <laughs> mm, I'm just opening the space for any shares from the panelists or from anyone else. Thanks. Okay. maybe i'll go I'll sh next week um i have a week of uh, going back to that region fes mm -hmm. uh, gonna be visiting many provinces and schools and meeting teachers and and i will share this i will share this conversation so you mm -hmm. will be, all of you will be with me um i will share this um and i'm i'm very grateful to to everyone um, in the sharing and in the listening mm -hmm. very very grateful three years ago i came to this conference because giovanni reminded me that oh yeah i follow you on facebook and i went oh and i just wrote on messenger and yep three years ago we had a nice dialogue there on messenger mm -hmm. uh it's not, you know, I come back to this conference, it's been three years and it's like I never left. It mm. is such a beautiful home. So thank you, Sierra, and everyone who puts this together. It's just amazing. Just amazing. Thank you all. Thanks for continuing to join us on this journey together. We all created, it's a very co-created effort <laughs> together. Maybe one last share before we close. Um, maybe I'll just say, we didn't actually talk about this in our group, which was lovely to um, be my group with Michael and Clément, but just, I just want to say I'm leaving also, and I talked about things that you'd said, Shivani, that um, really sort of stuck, struck me. But also the other thing was this image of the circ the, the two circles from Karima's story that then, um, is it Suniva? I, sorry, I don't see your, oh, Sunisa, sorry. Sunisa was used that as an as an example of, you know, sometimes it's I, I heard it as sometimes it's OK to just be in our same circle, but just mm -hmm. know that we are actually in the wider set of circles. And that, that really spoke to me as one of the tensions of kind of diverse, multiple group nature of our society. And I'm going to take that with me that sometimes we can just be in the same circle and also know that we are in the multiple circles at the same time. So thank you for that, all of you. So co-created beautiful symbol. Thank you, Ali, for that. Yes, that struck me too. There's so much compassion in this space. It's just like, wow. Yeah, my heart is full. Thank you so much to everyone. Um, just honoring yeah the infinite in all of you and all of us um feel free to open your mics um to close any words of gratitude to each other to ourselves to our children or in, within us to our elders within us mm. so much gratitude <laughs> yeah let's let's a little <laughs> <laughs> Open your mics. I would love to hear your voices. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Karima, Chivani, Lucilio, your wisdom. So, so beautiful. Sumisa. Oh.